Very good evening. Uh, uh, first of all, uh, uh, my sincere thanks to the All India Ophthalmic Society and Dr. Arup sir for this wonderful opportunity. Uh, uh, at the outset, I would like to acknowledge that we do receive research grant support from Alcon Laboratories, but has no relevance to this presentation. Uh, so this is an interesting case of a 62-year-old female who presented to us for uh, cataract surgery in the other eye. So she, she had her right eye cataract surgery done elsewhere. Excellent pseudophakia. Uh, practically no refractive error, uncorrected, almost uh, 612, 69 parts and uh, uh, correcting up to 69 uh, with a good single piece hydrophobic acrylic eye oil in the back. But the patient was extremely negative and extremely bitter when she presented to us and on finding out her only and only complaint was the negative dysphotopsia. So negative dysphotopsia typically means something uh, that the patient doesn't see. So there are two kinds of dysphotopsias, positive and negative. So typically most patients with negative dysphotopsia tend to come up uh, with uh, a symptom that they are able, as they feel as if their temporal vision is being blocked by an arc or a semicircle and generally it tends to go away and decrease in majority of the patient over a few months. But this patient was already more than nine months post-operatively uh, in the other eye and, and extremely bitter. So now she has come to us uh, for the other eye cataract surgery and she obviously doesn't want negative dysphotopsia in this eye that she wants us to operate. Uh, so we were in a, in a fix, you know, excellent surgery, single piece, hydrophobic, acrylic, the same eye oil that we are doing day in, day out in all the patients that we operate. So there was a lot of dilemma as to how should we go ahead with this patient for the other eye, what type of eye oil, what design, so on and so forth. So on reviewing the literature, there are several theories. Uh, uh, we won't go into the mechanism of negative dysphotopsia, but the management, typically the principles have been sort of sorted out reasonably well uh, over a period of time. And typically what most believe is that when the optic of the IOL is above the anterior capsule, so if there is no capsular covering over the optic, the chances of negative dysphotopsia are quite less. And therefore, management options have been suggested to put a three-piece IOL in the sulcus or exchange with in the bag IOL, exchange and in the bag IOL with the sulcus IOL, uh, as well as reverse optic capture has been recommended as a modality of treatment. Primary treatment can be various newer kinds of IOLs like uh, uh, the one, this one made by uh, Dr. Sam Maskett, uh, which is fixed on the anterior capsule. And there are several such modifications coming up in different IOLs. And I would also like to acknowledge uh, now recently our own Dr. Prakhyat Roop has come up with a negative dysphotopsia ring, which can be placed in the sulcus. And I think he's going to share that in the innovative session uh, uh, webinar tomorrow by the All India Ophthalmic Society. But at that point of time, this was not available. So having gone through the literature, having gone through our own surgical preferences, we decided that we are probably going to do a reverse optic capture in the second eye of this patient, which means the optic uh, remains above the capsule, whereas the haptics remain in the capsular back. Uh, now, the problem was then to choose which kind of eye oil, because generally single piece eye oils are quite difficult to capture either the conventional way or the reverse optic capture way because they have large optic uh, haptic junction and bulky uh, haptics. The three piece IOLs are more suitable for this kind of situation, but that would mean a larger incision uh, and probably refractive stability uh, is also a question mark. So, three piece IOL is uh, obviously likely to be a more preferable option. Uh, we counseled the patient, we reassured her that we will try our best, uh, you will have to give it some time and dysphotopsia may persist in spite of all our efforts uh, of trying to reduce it in this eye. Now on ocular examination, what we did realize was that she, she had significant corneal astigmatism. Now, if we do just the three-piece IOL, uh, it's unlikely to correct the astigmatism and therefore, uh, Although she may not get negative dysphotopsia, she's going to get a poor quality of vision. So that's probably making it even worse than having a negative dysphotopsia in the eye. So again, this was a dilemma for us, whether should we consider a toric IOL, a single piece, uh, and then try and reverse capture it, keeping in mind it has to be placed in a particular axis and so on and so forth. So we did decide that we will go as per plan A, that is to try and do a reverse capture of a toric eye oil. And if we are unable to achieve it, we'll probably go to plan B. The most important step when you are prophylactically going to plan a reverse optic capture is to have a slightly superior capsule uh, because that is going 
way that is going to lock the io this is too large even it's very likely that your logical approach or your planning is going to go haywire because the optic is not going to get stay captured over, uh, uh, above it uh, so try and make a smaller capsule rexis of course if the patient would have opted for it femto would have been the ideal choice because we can control the capsule rexis size now having done the lens removal and the polishing of the capsule we first decide to inject the toric iol in the bag so first uh, we want to make sure that the iol goes and sits completely in the bag including the haptics and the optics so right now it is like a normal in the bag iol that we have placed the iol in the bag with a good uh, uh, covering uh, and the uh, uh, astigmatism uh, iol you can see the toric iol now the second thing that we need to do is that before we do a reverse capture it's important to remove the viscoelastic from behind the eye because once you capture it it's almost impossible to go behind and remove the viscoelastic so we went ahead and this viscoelastic from behind the eye well like you would normally do in it Uh, then we decided to write assistance. It's uh, uh, not overlaid on the microscope at this point of time. And then what we did is coelastic. So we, of course, some little bit of this coelastic will go behind the iol, but at least most of it is out. And we inject a cohesive sodium hyaluronate viscoelastic above the iol. And now what we try to do is we try to, if you notice here, we are we are using these Lester hooks to try and prolapse the optic. Uh, of the iol in front of the anterior capsule so we have been able to do that on this side and then we are using again the spatula and the lester hook here to try and prolapse the optic out of the capsular bag so notice here the haptics are in the bag and the optic is now prolapsed uh, out of the capsular bag uh, and therefore you see this uh, this dumbbell sort of sign which you typically see uh, when you do a capture even in the conventional manner that is the anterior capsule leaflets the optic is above the actual anterior capsular leaflets uh, we go ahead and then remove the viscoelastic uh, uh, from front uh, of the optic uh, uh, to make sure that there are no residual viscoelastic and this posterior capsule fold uh, is also suggested that there is no residual viscoelastic behind the iol uh, and this is the patient uh, at 6 months for follow up no negative dysphotopsia excellent visual outcome and uh, a good intraocular pressure control what you will notice is these fine striae so these patients are more likely to get posterior capsule opacification much faster uh, than the average uh, uh, eye because the optic and the square edge of the optic is no longer going to help in preventing pco they are also likely to have more uh, prolonged inflammation uh, uh, and uh, uveal ir in uh, irritation so they are more likely to require non steroidal eye drops for a longer time Uh, so treatment for negative dysphotopsia reverse optic capture can be considered another case of a young diabetic cataract mainly posterior subcapsular soft cataract and we prefer four quadrant technique in most of these situations and somewhere while sculpting itself this large gap has been already created so we have three fourth of the nucleus inside the eye when we realize that we have a large gaping hole uh, staring down uh, uh, our uh, you know head and uh, this is the large posterior capsular rupture uh, we prefer pars plana approach for vitrectomy so whenever there is a, a, a capsular rupture you must make sure that you remove the vitreous not only what is present or prolapsed in the anterior chamber but also uh, uh, surrounding it so that it removes the vitreous base or it creates a good scaffold all around the posterior uh, capsular rupture so if you notice the vitrectomy probe is moving all around in this direction and having done that then we go ahead with uh, removing the lens uh, with phaco emulsification using of course very low bottle height and low parameters and if you have done a good vitrectomy the chances of this nucleus dropping are far less rather than if you have not done a vitrectomy the vitreous can entangle around it and can cause a drop in the nucleus so we were able to manage or prevent the nucleus from sinking we were able to remove the uh, uh, cortex and then we have this large area of posterior capsular rupture and the patient was planned for a toric iol so the first the ideal option would always be put a three piece iol in the bag and capture it through the anterior capsular rexis since it was intact Uh, having had some experience of reverse optic capture in negative dysphotopsia 
uh, we said let's go ahead go ahead and give it a try uh, of trying to do a reverse optic capture even in this situation this is more tricky because the posterior capsule is not uh, you know very regularly opened like a posterior capsule or excess so here we are very gently making sure that the optic uh, haptic junctions first goes inside the bag uh, and then we make sure that there is no vitreous disturbance and having removed the viscoelastic from front then what we go ahead is again try and do a reverse optic capture in this situation of prolapsing the optic in front uh, of uh, uh, the anterior capsular axis and once again this is the patient at 6 months uh, follow up uh, of course here there will be no pco because there is no posterior capsule in the center uh, and no macular edema it's important to monitor these patients uh, for peripheral retinal uh, events uh, because you have done a vitrectomy and vitreous disturbance has been there so i think reverse optic capture is a useful option to keep in a surgical armamentarium of uh, surgeons uh, it it is possible to be done with single piece iol designs including toric iols um, uh, of course it will be lot easier with a three piece design uh, and the mainstay i think would be to have a controlled uh, good anterior capsular rex is opening before considering uh, this option of reverse optic capture so i'd like to end my presentation here and uh, thank you so much for the patience so it was a wonderful uh, presentation uh...